Today marks the publication of Volume 2 of the History of Capitalism lecture series here at the Legatum Institute, A World Transformed, Studies in the History of Capitalism, a collection of lectures that were first delivered here in the Institute in the course of the year 2015. So we're very much on FET here, and as part of those facilities, we have with us, as our guest of honour at the reception this evening, Anthony Beaver is going to be with me in conversation on the whole question of what is history for and how he became an historian. Anthony, there are many reasons for studying history and indeed for the writing of history books. What are your reasons? Well, one has to be very careful about what history is for in some ways. The danger, particularly with uh, politicians and the media, uh, is the way they try to use history almost as a template for the future. When we're suffering in crises and conflicts and so forth, there's always a temptation to look back when you can't understand how things are going to develop in the future. And um, history is not a predictive mechanism, so it is a danger. And it may sound ironic coming from me, uh, but the real problem at the moment uh, is still, as we've seen ever really since the Second World War, is the way that the Second World War is used as the defining reference point for almost every crisis and every conflict. And this is very dangerous in strategic terms, in understanding and all the rest of it. And that, I think, brings one on to the real point of history. The, the duty of the historian is to understand. It is not to make moral judgments or anything like that. I, the historian, by understanding and by conveying that understanding, is actually doing Doing a very very important job in, in 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 its own particular in its own particular way, and I think that the this sort of underlines the real difference between uh, the Anglo-Saxon tradition of history, going back mainly to the 18th century, Gibbon, the decline and fall, that narrative tradition of history, um, which is very very different, of course, to the Germanic version today. Um, of course, Ranker was very much actually in the English tradition, if you like, and believed very much in developing developing cause and effect and uh, and the way the the duty of understanding. But what we see, in, say, in Germany, and to a certain degree in Scandinavia, is the feeling that the historian should have a thesis and then support that thesis by their research. Now, I think that's actually a corruption of history, because you will be selecting material to support your thesis. And we've had some appalling examples of that, Daniel Goldhagen being a, a, a prime example, in a way. The author of, of uh, Hitler's Willing Executioners. Where which told us that the whole of Germany was, was guilty. Well, it was basically saying that Germany was inherently an anti-Semitic nation. Well, actually, under Frederick the Great, Germany was the least anti-Semitic um, nation, or Prussia was the least anti-Semitic nation in Germany, in Europe. What one has to understand is how it changed later. Um, so I think that the, the, that particular at attitude, um, as I say, is very, very different. And I remember arguing once in um, Stockholm, uh, saying that uh, basically, you know, history can only be a branch of literature. It can never be tested in a laboratory. The the idea that it's a scientific, uh, uh, a scientific uh, subject in a way uh, is ludicrous because it can never be tested uh, to that particular way, and it is a branch of literature. And I remember uh, uh, an elderly Swedish professor coming up to me afterwards and murmuring in my ear. He said, um, "He said, actually, I agree with you." He said, "But in this country, that is uh, heresy." <laughs> the depth of the German influence on the Scandinavians. I'm afraid it is the depth of the German. There is, of course, another tradition of historiography uh, in Europe, the, the French tradition of historiography, dominant until pretty recently, the one that we associate with the Annales school and the notion of structural analysis. Uh, this school of thought was equally hostile to the notion of narrative and a chronology, wasn't it? Absolutely. Um, and in fact, it's quite interesting in the French history, it's very hard to find a date or a fact that you can actually pin down. It's an essai sur, um, a, a sort of rather high blow uh, analysis, um, which actually does not give you very, very much uh, information. And I think that's one of the sort of frustrating uh, aspects of it. It's also very similar to sort of French approach to biography, too. I mean, the, the Anglo-Saxon, again, is very, very different um, to the French in that particular way. Mm. One can't get away from the fact that history really 
is about people. It's about the narration of their lives, their biographies. And that's why chronology and narrative history makes a real sense to the reader. It's part of the general literature of uh, thought. Well, it, it is, and it's a fascinating story um, to understand how things evolved, um, to understand this sort of chain of cause and effect uh, which has evolved over the centuries. Um, of course, one must understand, you know, whether it's the price of corn or whatever, um, and how that can have an effect too. Um, but to have a totally materialist uh, interpretation um, of history uh, is extremely misleading. Um, I mean, you know, Tolstoy and uh, War and Peace is a great work of art, um, but the history lectures um, are simply infuriating and abominable um, in, <laughs> in the way that they treat um, the anti-great man theory of history. Hmm. Well, what, he, what Tolstoy had was a, a deterministic notion of, of history. It was very materialistic, really. It way, was, it? it was, in fact. It seems strange. Well, it was in a way sort of proto-Marxist, I suppose, but um, uh, even even though sort of Tolstoy preferred to see himself more as an anarchist, but uh, um, you know you can never really uh, predict how these things are going to turn out. Now, in a way, there's nothing tougher than the task of writing a book. Though so those of us who do try to write books shouldn't go on about that too much. It's a great privilege to be able to do so and to be asked to do so. But when you're setting about the task mm -hmm. of writing a book, choosing the evidence, thinking about the evidence, testing the evidence. Tell us about that, how you set about these, the initial work, the initial research. Well, the initial work is basically one of the background reading, of course, but also very much discussing with colleagues and with friends um, their views, their thoughts, their, even also their suggestions from the point of view of archives. I mean, that is where one is going to find uh, the important material. And again, this is where I think the great excitement lies in the archives, is when you find something which completely disagrees with what your assumptions were, you know you found something interesting. It's very important to have an open mind, isn't it? It is terribly important. Now, nobody is going to have a completely open mind, of course. Uh, we accept that. Um, but at the same time, you have to have an open mind. It's not a question of sort of condemning uh, even, even the monsters of history. You've got to understand why they behaved in the way that they did and explain it, whether it's a question of writing about Stalin. Um, one of the greatest monsters ever, but you've still got to understand why he behaved in the way that he did. Uh, and I think this is, um, this is very much true, but I find the problem in a way, and it's quite interesting, I mean, this last year, um, particularly in Scandinavian countries, particularly in Norway, one of the great questions coming from all of the Norwegian journalists was, you know, does evil exist? Of course, they're um, fascinated by Breakvik, uh, horrified still by Breakvik and that uh, terrible massacre on the island and all the rest of it. Um, and actually, the honest flaw, does evil exist? You know, is it a quasi-religious notion? Um, should it just be uh, an adjective and not a noun? Um, you know, I, I think that this is the area where um, historians are perhaps treading on the feet of philosophers, perhaps, uh, and they can't come up with an answer. Um, but at the same time, it is something which does hang over one's work. I remember talking to a very distinguished psychiatrist um, and asking him once, how he saw uh, Stalin and Hitler. And he said, in the case of um, Stalin, you can be fairly sure that he was a paranoid schizophrenic. He said, in the case of Hitler, all you can say is he had a personality disorder. <laughs> and I don't think I felt that I had advanced very, very much further as a result. Now, one of the great problems, in a way, that confronts uh, historians of the recent past, of the 20th century, is the sheer abundance of documentary material, of archival mm -hmm. wealth. Mm -hmm. And when you've been writing your books on various aspects of 20th century history, have you found that an overwhelming task? How do you select? Well, a very interesting point. Funny enough, I was discussing it literally, the very subject yesterday, um, with actually the chief of the general staff <laughs> of all people, um, because he was saying, you know, would you ever be able to write about the Iraq war? And I said, no, partly because we've got two problems. One is the way that ministers and generals, commanders in the field, are under such pressure from freedom of information uh, requests and all the rest of it, um, that they are starting to censor before the materials even got to the archives. The other thing is, of course, so much of it is electronic and um, how are you ever going to know that you've got the full picture? And I think that although there is also an abundance of material, sometimes even too much, uh, I think it's going to be very hard for historians to assess it. So um, I go for the period where there were still papers to go through, um, and I think that um, to deal with future conflicts and even recent conflicts, very recent conflicts, is going to be impossible.
And how do you test for truth, verification, when you come across something in a document that strikes you as being, this is very remarkable, this is very odd, this is an extravagant claim, but it's very interesting, yes. it might be true. Mm -hmm. How do you follow on from that? Well, there are several things uh, that one must do. Um, first of all, you obviously will try and cross-reference with other archives to see if there's support from other uh, sources and so forth. Um, <coughs> but the key thing, to a certain degree, you sometimes you do get start to get a nose for it. Uh, you get an instinct about what is forth, um, the way that it's written, um, <coughs> some of the words used. I mean, for example, when I was writing Stalingrad, I got terribly excited by one of the great bestsellers of the 1950s called Last Letters from Stalingrad. Um, but these actually were fakes. And I started, after an initial enthusiasm, thinking, this is fantastic. And then you start to pose questions. How did these people write these last letters when their hands were completely frostbitten? Um, and then, actually, when I got to the archives and I read some of the genuine last letters, which were flown out at the last moment, you saw that there were only just a couple of lines. They simply did not have the capacity to write these pages of rather literary prose. So one's got to have a very, you've got to have a very alert nose for, um, for the fake or for the misleading and the deliberately misleading. I mean, the German attitude sometimes in the past was, if it's an official in an official archive, you know, it's official. Um, and anything from a private archive archive or whatever, you know, you can't touch. Well, fortunately, they've now become much more, um, uh, much more open-minded about that, and they are prepared to uh, consider personal accounts, because actually, diaries are usually the most reliable of all, far more than letters, in a way. Uh, letters from soldiers were usually designed to relieve the suffering or the worries of people at home. Um, it was very, very seldom that they would actually describe the full horrors. Um, diaries, on the other hand, and particularly diaries written by women in the Second World War um, towards the end, when they knew they were living through an important moment in history, um, those on the whole tend to be totally reliable. Stories need a, a good nose when ferreting about for their fodder that may go into their books. Uh, an open mind, a good and inquiring mind, and good eyes to envisage the past, perhaps, as it comes back into view. Anthony, thank you very much indeed for these insights into the historian's craft. We're delighted to have you here at the Bogartic Institute for your first visit here as our guest of honour, and we're looking forward to a happy association with you when you return again, perhaps, in the very near future to lecture to us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much indeed.